There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode 10 of the Shine On Podcast, I'm Evan Shine. David Yaz, the executive producer of the Shine On Podcast, is with us. And we're going to be joined today by a friend of the Shine On Podcast, the divorce doctor. Elizabeth Cohen. She's back with us for an incredible episode. That's right. For episode number 10, The Divorce Doctor is back. And this is an interview that you do not want to miss. We will talk to Dr. Cohen about her new book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce. And I'll tell you what, her book is filled with nuggets of wisdom, tips, advice. And while there's no shortage of books out there in the divorce space to help someone either thinking about divorce or going through the divorce process, Dr. Cohen's book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce, is one I highly recommend. And Dave, can you believe we're on episode 10 yeah. of the Shine Up podcast? Yeah, and I like uh, how Dr. Cohen is re- returning. You're developing your little posse. We need a name for your posse, you know, Shine's crew or Shine. I'll come up with something. <laughs> we should open it up to the Shine Up podcast listeners. That's right. That's right. Yes. And Dave, I'll tell you what, as, as we look ahead to what's upcoming on the Shine Up podcast, as we finish up the 10th episode of the podcast, the guest that we have lined up, it's exciting, it's special, and thank you to all the listeners for taking this ride with us. We love getting the questions and the comments and the feedback, and the future guests that have come on the podcast, their takes, their perspective. Speaking of special guests, Dr. Cohen is back with us as our featured guest on episode 10 of the Shine Up podcast. And Dave, as we pass the one-year mark of living in COVID, we're going to look back and talk to Dr. Cohen about the lessons learned from this past year when it comes to mental health and the challenging times, loss, loneliness, separation, divorce, that in some way or shape or form, many of us have experienced. And with the clocks turning ahead, as we now inch closer to being reunited with friends, family, coworkers, loved ones, and as we enter this new normal of socialization and life, what does this look like for people who were contemplating divorce during the past year, yet felt stuck, feeling unable to move forward because of covid and the circumstances. We are going to get thoughts on this. Talk to Dr. Cohen about her incredible book, which is coming up on the other side of the docket. All right, counselor. I have the docket locked and loaded. You ready, my friend? Let's do it, Dave. All right, let's do it. And now, let's see what's on the docket. All right, first on the docket... Everyone's favorite British singer, Adele. She is uh, sorting out the details after her divorce. According to StarTribune.com, Adele will share custody of her 8-year-old son and won't be paying child support to her now ex-husband, Simon Konecki. According to divorce documents obtained by the AP, the couple separated in August of 2019. Adele filed for divorce the following month, and they used mediation to amicably reach the terms of the split. Your thoughts? Hey, there's a few nuggets to take away from this article. First, it's, it's great to see that Adele's divorce is now finalized. As you mentioned, the couple separated in 2019, and Adele filed for divorce shortly thereafter. And now she's officially divorced in 2021. Adele and ex-husband Simon, Simon Konecki, they're now officially divorced approximately 18 months later. And look, we've talked about before on the Shine Up podcast, about the divorce process and the length and just how long the process can take. You don't get divorced overnight. It doesn't matter how amicable the process is. It's going to take a significant amount of time from when the divorce starts to when the divorce is finalized. And look, I've said it before and I'll say it again. As a divorce attorney, I think it's so important to explain this to clients and to do it early on. 
what the process looks like, what's involved, and what's a realistic expectation as to timing. And what are the aspects of a divorce that could cause the process to go on longer? Is it the parties themselves? Is it unreasonable and mismanaged expectations or certain complexities with the particular divorce depending on the assets, the estate, and whether there's going to be a fight over money and the kids? You know that question, Dave, that we're always asked, what's the superpower that you want to have? Right. Just maybe if I had the superpower to wave a magic wand and get someone divorced overnight, <laughs> maybe, maybe mm-hmm. I would do that. Yeah, you, but could the be, truth is, you could be divorced, man. I'll get you a cape. I should yeah. get yeah, a cape and a magic sure. wand. But yeah. look, the truth is, <laughs> if the process isn't, isn't explained thoroughly to a client by an attorney, it's a process that can be super hard for a client to understand. And when I take over cases from other attorneys, when clients make a switch, one of the most common things I hear from clients is, I didn't know that. I didn't know this is how it works. And clients need to know what the process looks like and what's involved. And in Adele's case, the article references that the parties used mediation to amicably resolve their divorce and reach terms of their split. Look, this is absolutely fantastic to see, and I love it. Mediation, it's a wonderful process, and it's a great option for people looking to resolve their divorce without litigation and without court involvement. It's also wonderful to see that Adele and her ex-husband agreed to joint legal and physical custody of their son. And coming to an agreement on this without court intervention, it definitely saved Adele and so many people who can come to the same terms and reach a resolution in mediation. It saves so much time and so much money as opposed to litigating custody and finances through the court system. And most importantly, it protects the involvement of the children. It's also refreshing to see they both waived rights to spousal support. And it's which uh, you tell me, Evan, I think it sounds pretty rare in, in a high profile divorce. The This her ex-husband is the co-founder of LifeWater. So uh, usually, I, maybe I'm being cynical, there's usually a fight over, over who's going to pay who what. And it sounds like they really did get on the same page in mediation. Well, they did. And look, that's one of the benefits of mediation. You can come to an agreement that works for both parties without litigating, without fighting over who should get what. And look, without knowing the level of detail of Adele's finances and her ex-husband's finances, it's hard to say would either one of them been entitled to receive spousal support. But to me, this is more about the process of mediation and coming to an agreement that works for both parties without going through the court process. And also, look, we haven't heard much about Adele's divorce. I mean, Dave, we've talked about before on the podcast about celebrities litigating their divorce in the public eye on social media. There hasn't been all that much about this divorce, Adele, her ex-husband litigating in the public spotlight. True. True enough. All right, moving on. Next on the docket, according to an article in the Tampa Bay Business Journal, attorney Amanda Colon tells us there are five things your divorce attorney should be telling you. I'll tick them off real quick, and then you can pick and choose, Evan, or agree and disagree. Number one, your attorney should be telling you adult children are still the children. Number two, be transparent with financial information and discovery. Number three, follow your attorney's instructions and stay organized. Number four, litigating the so-called principle of the matter can be costly with devastating results. And number five, we can litigate, but that's not where we're going to start. Your thoughts? Dave, look, I have to tell you, I agree with each and every one of these five points made in the article with one thing to add, which I'm going to get to in a second. But first, the biggest issue is not every attorney, and in fact, I would say it's pretty rare for an attorney to have these upfront conversations with their clients. The one thing I would add or change is really to point number five. And while starting a case without litigation and without seeking the court's involvement or bringing a case in front of a judge, it may be an aspiration and the hope, and I encourage it. Look, the reality is it's not always possible, and it may not be up to your client. 
there are certain reasons and issues that come up all the time that absent an agreement from the other side or the other spouse is going to put your case in the court system from the beginning, whether it's substance abuse in custody cases or the need for supervised parenting time or an emergency issue as I just had surrounding school or someone's hiding money or transferring incredible amounts of money out of the country. Those are times where you're going to need to go to a judge and you're going to need to go to a judge pretty quickly. I have a few quick points I would add to the list. Mm -hmm. Number six, your divorce is not going to be resolved tomorrow, no matter how amicable you think it is. And no matter how amicable it may be, it's still going to take time. Number seven, there's two sides to every story. While my client may come into my office and say, Evan, everything's resolved. I had a great conversation with my husband and an agreement's ready to be drafted. That may be true, but trust me when I tell you, more often than not, it's not the case. And there's another side to it that it's going to add both to the time and the cost of the process. Number eight, there's at least four people involved in every case. You have the clients and you have the attorneys. Forget about experts and evaluators and appraisals for purposes of this. But look, the truth is for a case to be resolved quickly and amicably and in a cost-efficient way, all four people, the two clients, two attorneys, everyone needs to be on the same page and have the same interest. And all it takes for the case to be longer, be more expensive, and to be dragged out unnecessarily is for just one. Let me say that again. Just one of those four people to be on a different page, have a different agenda, and the case goes on. Very good, my friend. We'll, we will have one more item for the docket today. According to an article on the Today Show's website, we can always count on Jennifer Garner to find the silver lining. In 2015, one day after their 10th wedding anniversary, Garner and her now ex-husband, Ben Affleck, announced their divorce. Uh, a year later, Garner told Vanity Fair she had lost the dream of dancing with her husband at her daughter's wedding. But the article goes on, time heals all wounds. The veteran actor and star of the new movie Yesterday has a fresh perspective. When our kids get married, she says, we'll dance. I know that now. We'll boogaloo and we'll have a great time. I don't worry about that anymore. Well, good for Jen. I don't know what the what boogaloo means. I don't know, necessarily want to <laughs> see her boogaloo, but it, but it is. I'm going to tell you, you know. <laughs> You wouldn't mind? You know, there's so much there's so much great information and takeaways in this article. Yeah. But I have to tell you, I, I read that word about five different times. You know, I don't think I've ever heard that word. <laughs> no, well, it's the you remember the movie when breakdancing was all the rage. The the sequel of the famed movie or infamous movie Breaking was Breaking Two Electric Boogaloo. So maybe that's maybe she's going to break dance. But I don't know if I want to see that. Suicide. Yeah. Look, yeah. great article by Kate Hansen. <laughs> yeah. And if you're wondering what that noise is, that's me clapping my hands because (laughs) congratulations to to Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck for getting it and getting it for their children, putting them first. Garner and Affleck have co-parented their three kids together since their split in 2015. And look, it couldn't have been easy. We know it hasn't been easy for the two of them, given the publicity of their divorce and the reports on the relationship and marriage and why things ended. And look, it's not easy for children whose parents are in the spotlight. On a prior episode, Dave, we talked about Affleck and how the divorce and what he went through and his experiences have impacted him and really helped him move forward and positively in many ways in his career. And we gave him credit for that. And now I'm going to give credit to Jennifer Garner. And this article highlights it because co-parenting three children in the public spotlight And going through the divorce process is not easy. And for many celebrities, it often feels like a divorce circus that never ends because of the tabloids and the paparazzi. And it isn't easy to keep children out of the divorce and the spotlight. And Gardner and Affleck, they both largely have kept their children out of the spotlight, which is a credit to them, but it's definitely not been easy. The article talks about how in 2013, Garner was an integral part of getting a bill passed to protect children of celebrities by testifying before the California State Assembly Committee. And she did this with Holly Berry, as the article notes, 
And I have to imagine they're not alone with other celebrities also making tremendous efforts to protect and shield their children going through a divorce. For sure. And it's, you know, for those I've, I've mentioned my personal divorce on your show before, and I can tell you there, there are things that you realize you give up when you get divorced and it makes you sad. But then there are moments like this too, when you realize, well, why not? So, so why not dance with Ben at the, at the wedding? You know, the kids, I mean, their oldest kid is 15. They still got a ways to go, (laughs) but, but you can, you can still, there, there is happiness on the other side. There's, there can be peace and, and even love and respect on the other side too. So I agree with you. Good, good on you. Jennifer. Hey Dave, we've talked about that, that the, the co-parenting relationship and how it can take time. But once you get to the place, and, and we've talked about it you know, with guests, and, and we touch on it with Dr. Cohen in the interview, the, the, when, when the focus shifts to the children and prioritizing them and healing and processing the divorce, you find yourself not only happier with yourself, but in a happier and better co-parenting relationship. Our featured guest this week is friend of the Shine Up podcast, the divorce doctor, clinical psychologist, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, who is nice enough to join us for a second time on the Shine Up podcast. Dr. Cohen has been featured on the Tamron Hall Show, the Wall Street Journal, NBC News, Women's Health, Huffington Post, Thrive Global, Daily Beast, and Good Housekeeping. She's a weekly contributor to Psychology Today with her absolutely fantastic divorce course column. Dr. Cohen, I appreciate the time. How are you? Thanks so much, Evan, for having me. I love being here and talking with you. And Dr. Cohen, I have to tell you, it is absolutely fantastic to have you back on the show. Your episode number five on the Shine Up podcast was one of the most listened to episodes yet. I'm glad to have you back, and I know my listeners are too. Oh, great. I'm so happy to hear that and happy to be here for your listeners. And Dr. Cohen, let's reset the stage for anyone who missed the prior episode when you came on. You're a clinical psychologist based in New York City. You're the author of an upcoming book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce. And since you last appeared on the Shine Up podcast, you have launched a podcast of your own, The Divorce Doctor. Yeah. Congratulations on the book and the podcast. Thank you so much. You inspired me, Evan. I cannot be the kind of podcast interviewer you are, but I do my best. <laughs> That's what we do on the Shine Up Podcast. We inspire. <laughs> and I have to ask you, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> my kids would say there's a lot. My teenagers would tell you there's a lot of things I'm not doing for them. But <laughs> Let's not ask them. But, but I want to start by talking to you about your book, which is titled Light on the Other Side of Divorce. Tell us about the title and why you wanted to write the book. Wow. Well, I always get kind of teary when I talk about why I wanted to write the book. I mean, I wrote this book for so many people. I wrote this for myself for what that night when I opened up my laptop and had just put my kids to sleep and typed into Google divorce recovery program, and I couldn't find anything. And I felt alone and scared. And even with all of my privilege of education, took a long time to put piece together a healing program. And I really wrote this for the parent who walks into the library to bring their kids to the free, you know, reading hour and maybe hasn't taken a shower, maybe hasn't changed their clothes, going through a divorce, just whiplashed and happens to see out of the corner of their eye, the name of my book. And maybe that gives them just a little bit of hope that they will move through what they're going through. And Dr. Cohen, it's such a, such an incredible response. And you use the words whiplash. You use the words yeah. hope. Talk to us and tell us about that night that you reference when you're searching in Google and you couldn't find the tools, the resources really out there to help you in what you went through. And also, you know, as you write your book, what was missing out there for so many people experiencing the exact same thing that you went through? So I think, Evan, when I couldn't find anything, it confirmed an assumption that I had that I think we learn in our culture that a divorce was the ending and that it was 
a failure or a mistake that I should kind of give up. Like there wasn't anything to move through. So it just confirmed my feeling of being a failure when I couldn't find anything. And I knew inside of me, I think probably as someone dedicated to helping people heal their past wounds as a therapist, that I had to be able to move through this. And I had to be able to have something better on the other side but I sure as heck couldn't be my own therapist. Like I, I needed other people to help me do that. And to be honest, I tried a lot of things that didn't work. And then I kind of pieced together things that is what makes up this book, which are, you know, strategies, both for your mind, your body, and your heart for all parts of you, because you need to heal all, all of you. You mentioned your mind, your body, your heart. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the book. Let's talk about some of those chapters yeah. and i think the perspective as i read through the book and your take on it it's so incredibly unique and i want to talk about a few chapters two yeah. that deal with the actual divorce process and one is going to be on navigating the fun yet complicated world of post-divorce dating that yeah. second chapter that second act and really to shift the mindset to be optimistic about what's ahead I want to start with the chapter in your book, which is titled The Secret Tool to Managing Divorce, How Pleasure is the Key to Healing. And I have to tell you, anytime I see that anything is a secret, I, of course, I want to know about it. <laughs> so I love the title and I love the chapter. And as a yeah. divorce attorney, I see clients all the time in my work looking for tools, looking for techniques to navigate the process, mm -hmm. whether it's court appearances or emails from attorneys or meetings, or when I request clients put together financial documents, it's a full-time job and it's often yeah. overwhelming. And I think what gets lost for so many people is that not only are they going through the divorce process and that they're asked to be super responsive in just about everything I mentioned above, they're also doing this while trying to process the emotional impact of divorce, the loss, the transition, and oh, by the way, parent and work at the same time. What's the key to managing it and healing while going through it? Yeah, miraculous, right? I mean, this is why I call the people in my online program super heroes, because just what you said that people have to go through when they're going through a divorce and what they have to manage is just miraculous. And so the strength is really unbelievable. So I want to talk a little bit about that secret tool, the, the pleasure tool. One of the most important things I, I think... This book is for people who are ready to hand over the negativity and the taking of the inventory of their ex to you, you know, to the litigator, to the lawyers, like let them handle your ex. You and I have talked about this before, right? Sure. I'm going to handle me. And so this is a book for when you are ready to say what I cannot change the other person. I cannot change what happened, but I can work and understand more about me and I will then be able to have so much healing. So that's really the first step. And a lot of people, I know I was in this way in my divorce. I had no idea who I was after I got divorced. I had dedicated so much to my marriage and so much to my children that I had no idea what I really wanted. I tell this story about how I went to see a psychiatrist and the depths of my depression around my divorce. And I was talking with him for about 20 minutes and he very loudly said, stop. I'm not even gonna say it. Stop telling me about him. Tell me about you. And honestly, Evan, I was silent. I had, I didn't, I hadn't thought about myself. I hadn't thought about where I was, what I wanted, what I had no idea. And so that was in a moment of realization of, wait a minute, I need to figure myself out. And one of the most important things and the secret that we have that we just do not connect to enough is we have this ability to find pleasure. And that is an incredibly important way to tune into what we want. Now, I talk in the book, big difference between, between sexuality and sensuality. So I'm not talking about sexual pleasure at this point. I'm talking about sensual pleasure, meaning using all your five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and feel. And how do you, how are you in the world with all of those senses? So one small thing we start with is the next time you reach for your grab your, to grab your coffee, you notice what it feels like to put your hand 
around the warm mug. You actually notice the sensation of warmth going from the cup to your hand. That is a moment, a one moment of pleasure where you are dialing in to your own experience. And you might say it's small. Your listeners might think that's such a small thing, but I promise you connecting to who you are is just a ton of little small things built on top of each other. Well, and I would think to, to take your last point, those small moments, they're powerful, they're real. And they, when the focus is turned to yourself and inwards, it gives someone hope. It gives someone the ability to look at things differently as she or he goes through the process. Exactly. And the good news is when we do things that we like, when we find, you know, maybe you actually like touching cold water or maybe, you know, you like silk or you like flannel. The more we do things that our body specifically likes, we release neuroendorphins that help with relaxation and pleasure. We have beta endorphin and oxytocin. And so those things actually rush through our body and help relax us. And I know if your listeners are thinking, I don't have time for this. I've got so much going on. I hear you. That's why I'm suggesting just a moment with the cup or the next time you drink some water, feeling what it feels like to have cold water go down your throat. You know, we need to retrain our brain. Um, Our brain is Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good. So when we were living and we were hunting and gathering, we had to know where the lions were. We didn't have to know where the beautiful flowers are. So we actually have to actively retrain our brain to focus on the joy and on the connection because our brains are actually trained to focus on the negativity. I love that. Retraining the brain, focusing on what's positive. And you mentioned something in the beginning about letting your lawyer focus on dealing with the other attorney, dealing with your soon-to-be ex, as opposed to having trying to tackle this in the process all by yourself, or having one person do everything. How important is it, the concept of a team working with an attorney, working with, you know, a professional, someone like yourself to separate who's doing what so you can focus on getting through the process, both the legal aspect, which Mm -hmm. is something I deal with, and also the, the steps to heal and processing the loss in transition. You know, Evan, that's such a good question about the team. And I know you and I agree so much on the team approach. And I just had this thought, which I haven't had before, which is, I feel like there's this moment where when we're when we get divorced, we somehow think we need to do all things all the time. Like it's as if we wake up and suddenly we think everything is our responsibility. Now maybe that was how you were in your marriage or when you were growing up. But it's more it's wild because thinking, for example, like I would never think to do my own taxes because I'm not a CPA, right? So I would, but something about going through divorce, I'd be like, oh yes, I should do my financials. Like where does that come from, right? Why do we have to take, we're already taking on so much. And I, when you were talking about your, the attorney, I think about it, you know, you need someone to walk on that battlefield for you in that, who is prepared, who has the experience, who has the knowledge, and you need to allow them to advocate for you. But what if we thought about all the team members as actually advocates? So you advocate for advocate for them legally. I advocate for their emotional health, right? And we know someone advocates for them financially. And we know that if you have an advocate, and I know this specifically for emotional work, all these those other areas will go easier. Because what happens with emotions is they come out sideways. So if you stuff them, you know, you might show up to your lawyer's office. We've talked about this before. I think that people constantly say like, I just want the judge to see that I'm a good parent. Like, guess what? They're not there to do that. And they're not going to do that. Like if you're worried, you're not a good parent, bring that to me, bring that. Let's talk about your fears and let's challenge those. Well, that's the thing. We have talked about it before here on the Shine Up podcast where, you know, clients going through a divorce do look to the judge, the court system to, you know, yell at their soon to be ex or to, you know, validate a concern or a feeling. And there's different professionals for different things. And in my experience, and, you know, I know we're on the same page with this, when you have professionals in a certain lane, really, and your word choice is brilliant as an advocate, for different areas of someone's well-being, the legal, 
part of it, you know, my territory, the emotional, the mental health, something you focus on. It's better for the person going through it so he or she could focus on what's most important, making the process more efficient. And in my experience, it leads to a much more positive experience in the long run. Absolutely. And shorter, I think, too. Less protracted, right? It allows me to focus on, you know, the parts of the case, the parts of the divorce Mm -hmm. from the legal side of things in a much more efficient and effective way. Right. And, you know, I I know when you're going through a divorce, if you're listening now, it does, you don't feel like it's ever going to end, but it will, and it needs to end so that you can move on. And so the more you can help yourself heal while you're going through it, the greater the abundance down the road. Speaking of moving on, let's talk about the importance of self-care. Yes. Both in the divorce process and also after divorce. And I think this topic in the chapter of your book is self-care central. And you (laughs) refer to it as the art of taking care of yourself and why it is essential when going through a divorce. I think this is so incredibly important. And I absolutely love that you refer to self-care as essential. And Mm -hmm. I've encouraged my own clients to find time during the process. Do something that brings you enjoyment. Do something that brings you happiness. And don't let the divorce process be overwhelming and consuming. But the most common question I get in response, and I'm assuming you get it as well, how do I find the time? I'm juggling so much. How do I make time to focus on myself during the process? So I think first we have to start under, we need to start with an understanding of how unsupportive our entire culture is of self-care. We don't even have, you know, we only have the word selfish and selfless, right? We don't really, so if you're taking care of yourself very often, people will see that as selfish. So we need to, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I work a lot on assumptions and breaking those down and realizing that, okay, if I need to do what feels right for me in this moment and setting a boundary, that's self-care, that's not selfish. And so I think people first, and I talk about this in the book, really need to get comfortable with self-care. And I I say in the book, you know, I assume a lot of people are going to skip over, just like you said, like skip over this chapter. And I say, just take a minute and imagine that this chapter was about the best way to take care of your kids. I bet you'd read it. So why don't, right? So why don't you treat yourself as gently and as kindly as you would your kid or even your neighbor or somebody else? And so I think to answer your question about not having enough time, it goes back to the small bites. It goes back to doing a little thing every day. But in the chapter, I also talk about things you might not think are self-care, like learning how to say no, you know, right? Like sometimes self-care is not just, it's wonderful to be able to get a massage or to put lotion on your feet or take a bath, but saying no to something you don't want to do and not getting involved in something is a beautiful way of doing self-care. That's such a great point. And when I read this chapter, something else that I thought of is the importance of self-care when you're going through a divorce. And in your book, you talk about the transition from the divorce process to post-divorce life. I would think that self-care and finding happiness and doing things, small things, big things during the process, that would help the transition to living in this post-divorce world to dating, which we're going to talk about to finding happiness. How important is self-care, not only to getting through the divorce process, but helping you to transition to life after divorce? I think that's such a good question. And actually, if you create a self-care plan, which we talk about in the book, that's actually a blueprint to give to a future partner or, you know, for figuring out what apartment you want. Like it, it is a blueprint of and your instruction manual of what you like. And that is a gift to anyone who's in relationship with you. And it's a gift to yourself when you want to plan a life, as I talk about in the book, by design, not by default. And so I think self-care, I, I don't know, you know, a lot of people, I understand this, feel like I'll relax after the divorce is over, right? I'll wait until it's all the stress is over and then I'll go away on vacation. And like, First of all, you'll probably get sick on that vacation. Like the the thing about self-care and the thing about, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. We need to continually take care of ourselves 
or we will burn out is a real thing. And unfortunately, with the divorce process, if you wait until start that, whether it's take a vacation, doing something fun for yourself, you may find yourself waiting two or three years. Right. And think about what that does to you over time. I mean, we have to live in this moment. I, I don't know if you find this, Evan, but I do find that a lot of my clients, I have to teach them to stop holding their breath during the divorce period, that the divorce period is actually a period. It's happening right now. So how do we manage living in the divorce time rather than just waiting for it to be over or the alternate or like we're think like ruminating on when we weren't getting divorced. It's like, you have to be in the moment. It's a great way to think about it. You use the word burnout. Yeah. When you use that word, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with a client a few weeks ago and she called in and, and she felt stuck. She felt stuck and has felt stuck over the past year. And I yeah. want to talk to you about shifting the mindset to yeah. feeling that way going forward. And I see clients of mine as a divorce attorney, people feel stuck in bad relationships, in unhappy marriages, and people have the debate in their own mind, should I or should I not move forward with mm -hmm. the divorce? Am I ready to take the next step in the process? And almost all the time, I hear a client say, I know I'm unhappy, I know this marriage is not working, but I'll stay in it for my children until they go off to college. How does the mindset change? How does the mindset shift? And the conversation turns from one I just described to one of optimism and hope and recognition that you can live a happy post-divorce life. So I think it's such a good question, Evan. And you know, you always point out such important and real experiences that happen for people. I also hear this all the time. I think it goes back to putting the focus on you. When a client says to me, I'm going to wait till my kids go off to college to separate. I say, okay, let's play a little game. I want you to imagine that your daughter comes to you. She's a sophomore in high school. And she says, I just got paired up with this person um, as a lab partner and they're fine. They're nice. I don't really have that much fun with them, but it's good enough. And everyone, all my friends have a boyfriend, so I'm going to start dating him and I'll just date him through high school. And then when I'm done with high school, I'm sure I'll meet someone in college, but you know, he's fine. He's just not that great. Not that good for me. Like, what would you say to your kid? You wouldn't be like, sounds like a great idea. Settling is great. Why don't you keep up? You know, you'd be like, no, of course girl. Not. And would you right? tell that story? A hundred percent. And would you tell that story? I, I would think that hits home. Yes, it hits home people. And then I also will add, you have to realize that you're sending the message to your kids that your happiness and your connection with a partner, that doesn't take first priority. Everyone else's needs takes first priority. So it is more likely that they might meet someone who you're like, why are they with that person? You know, it's all about the other person all the time. Well, what did they learn from watching you? So not to sound like an after school special, but that is what it's like <laughs> no, it's, when it, I said it's, it. It's absolutely, it's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I think it's, I think that's one of the things I point out is really like, why are you not taking care of yourself in the way in the, giving the advice you would to someone else? That's a big thing we do in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is kind of what advice would you give to another person? It helps you get out of the um, mindset of, I have to do this in a certain way. It helps you get, give you some more flexible thinking. I also want to say that one of the big pieces of my book is shifting the assumptions we have about divorce and about marriage, that what if we thought of when we were getting a divorce, our relationship has come to its perfect conclusion. I love it. Right. Like, imagine how, like, it did what it needed to do. I learned what I needed to learn. We have these beautiful children, and now it's time for something else. Instead of, I screwed it up, he, they screwed it up, you know, whatever it is. But those thoughts and, and that changing that perception, you know, when, when there's that negativity surrounded about, well, we only made it 10 years or 15 yeah. years, how do we change that to saying, you know what, we've raised two incredible kids, or yeah. I've learned what I've learned. And, you yeah. know, now there's going to be a next chapter. How does that conversation yeah. change yeah. where there's a more positive and different outlook surrounding getting divorced? So that is, I mean, that's part of my mission is changing the voice, changing that. It is hard work. It is brain retraining. 
So just like any muscle, right, Evan, if you go to the gym, you don't like, you know, lift weights for four minutes and suddenly have like a super, you know, six pack, like you, you have to do it every day in practice. So I have a little exercise that I have in the book where I ask people to write down the words that they associate with divorce. So failure, broken, disappointment. And then I ask them to write the opposite words on the other column. Um, an oper- so let's say like opportunity, growth, the opposite of the negative word. And I assign them as an assignment that the next time someone asks you, how's your divorce going? You choose those words. You choose the positive words. And it's going to feel uncomfortable at first. It's going to feel like wearing someone else's clothes. But you kind of practice and notice how it feels to say those words and other people's responses. So how is your divorce going? You know, it's really given me an opportunity to, for me, it was like watch TV in bed and watch whatever I wanted to. Just to like small little shifts. So it's, again, small bite-sized pieces and it's actually practicing. And I think by those bite-sized pieces, when the transition of the time comes to live in a world post-divorce and really navigating, whether it's dating, whether Mm -hmm. it's reconnecting with people, whether it's to co-parenting, those bite-sized pieces, it it helps the transition. It helps finding happiness and really navigating that complex world. And Dr. Cohen, you talk about in your book about embracing post-divorce life. And I love that. And you talk about how it can offer opportunity for happiness rather than despair. So I want to ask you to talk about your program, Afterglow, which you developed to help people with that. Tell us about it and the methodology behind it. Yes. So the Afterglow program, which is my online program, is a course based on research-supported treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, somatic experiencing therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And it helps you really heal different parts of, your, again, your heart, mind, and soul that needed to be healed and your body so that you can step into this next chapter feeling more alive. And it involves the worksheets, there are worksheets in the book, there are worksheets in the online program, and there are assignments that really, again, help with this brain retraining because it's going to take time. Like it's not overnight. It's not suddenly you wake up. I mean, I share that in my divorce, I've been divorced now 12 years. I still have moments where I need to use these strategies. I just had one the other day. It doesn't go away. It's a practice. It's a way of engaging with your divorce. I would say that's what the program is about, how to engage with your divorce in a different way. Let's take that and talk about another chapter in your book, which is jumping back into the pool, dating, post-divorce. I would imagine this is such a tricky area and it's scary. It's fun. It's frightening. There's so many mixed thoughts and feelings that goes through everyone's minds. What are the challenges for someone looking to get back, jump into it, how to do it, and when's the optimal time? So I I think what you have to think about with dating post-divorce is that it's all a laboratory, that it's all, or a game, it's all a way to understand more about you. Many people step into divorce after dating, I mean, dating after divorce and say like, no one's good for, they're no good people or this is never going to work, you know, bringing all these assumptions from the past. And I just encourage people to be incredibly curious. I created something called the relationship pattern excavator in the book. And the relationship pattern excavator requires you to really look deeply at all your past relationships and your behaviors, non-judgmentally, but to just start looking for patterns so that when you start going out with other people, you can try to notice, is this my pattern? Can I do a little something outside my pattern? I tell this story that um, my divorce ended because of my ex-husband's alcoholism. And in the book, I share that my the first person I went on a date with, I had such a great time with him. We were having so much fun. We were hanging out. And he says to me, at, we're drinking some wine. And he says to me, oh, you're a psychiatrist. By the way, I'm a psychologist, but you're a psychiatrist. Exactly. (laughs) Well, this is what he says to me. He says, you're a psychiatrist. You can prescribe me Xanax, Clonopin, or Ativan, right? And I laugh at that. And then the date continued. And then the next day, I was in a support group for uh, people of family members of alcoholics. And I laughed to myself. And I thought, here I am again, right? Like, I didn't, I wasn't selling drug, but here I was attracting the same type of person. And I thought, okay, this is good information. 
Like, this is good information about me. What is it about me that's, and then I was really able to understand what I wanted to do differently. And I love that because I would think if you don't look within, if you don't take that deep, hard look into your past, you'll find yourself making the same choices and yes. really going through similar experiences, which yes. is hard, it's challenging, and at times it can be defeating. Exactly. Exactly. And I think you sometimes end up, as you said, in the same situation and you, and then you get this assumption, all people are this way because this keeps happening, but really maybe there's a little shift that you could have done. I just tell the story that for me, I didn't even know that humility could exist and I'm heterosexual and a man. And so once I realized that was my number one thing I wanted to know about somebody, all these new men kind of came into my life who I had been overlooking because that wasn't what I was really interested in. So even that one little shift, I think changed everything. And I want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about lessons learned, whether it's lessons learned from your, your past relationships, your prior marriage, the divorce process. I want to talk a little bit about COVID and the lessons that we can learn from the past year as we now pass the one-year mark of living in quarantine, living in a COVID world. This past year has been filled with such loss and and unpredictability and uncertainty. And at the same time, it's also been an opportunity for deep self-reflection. And there's been such incredible focus and awareness on mental health. And I want to ask you, as you look back on this past year, what lessons can we take and apply to the future And what has this past year showed us about the importance of mental health? Oh, such a good question. Oh, wow. First of all, I, I, you know, I think it's really important. My doctoral research was on this to know that most people who suffer mental health issues after a trauma like this, which COVID has been, are people who were really struggling or had pre-existing conditions of mental health struggles before. And I think it's really important for us to know that we have been overlooking mental health and mental illness so much. We have been going and assuming that everyone is okay and they should be okay when many people are not. So I think I'm grateful in some ways. I mean, this is the the message about COVID that I was just talking to my teenager about this over the weekend. It's so hard to hold, which is that there has been so much grief and so much pain, and so much loss because of COVID. And as I call it, the golden and, there has been a lot that people have learned. There has been internal growth. There has been growth within family systems. The whole court system learned how to use Skype, you know? I mean, a lot of things have shifted that will shift potentially forever. Sure. And there will be some incredible things that that come out of this and lessons learned. And you mentioned the court system and the way we're living and the way I'm conducting court appearances virtually, the way, you know, we're going to interact with our family and friends and the way our lives are going to change for the better and how we think about things and how we approach things and really the conversations we may have with our children, with our partners, with their spouses And those conversations will, in many ways, I would think, help guide the next step, the next chapter, whether it's in family relationships or for people who are contemplating and thinking about divorce Mm. and what someone wants out of a relationship and someone looking to have a deeper and more meaningful connection than ever before. Yeah, I think that word connection is, I mean, I think we have never been faced with the deep importance of connection as we have in this last year and what that means. And even, you know, who do I want to be quarantined with, you know, because, you know, who, who in the next pandemic would I be comfortable with that? It's we've shifted how we think about connecting to people. And I think how we connect to ourselves. I heard someone say that when we had this stay at home order, what would it have been like if we could have seen that as coming home to ourselves? If we were asking ourselves, like, what do I need? What's going on for me? I think that would be really valuable. And that's a lesson that that I've certainly learned, which is 
to tune into myself, tune into my local, my environment right here, not everything outside of there. That's something I've certainly learned during COVID. And that's such a fantastic answer, Dr. Cohen. And staying with the lessons learned, you launched the podcast, The Divorce yeah. Doctor, which I've listened to, I've told mm-hmm. you before, I love, I can't get enough of it. Tell us about The Divorce Doctor podcast and your purpose, your mission. So Divorce Doctor podcast, I interview women and men who've gone through divorce and they share their story. They share their experience, their strength, and their hope. And I, when I was going through a divorce, I would have died to hear other people's stories. I just felt so alone with my story. And I felt, as we talked about before, kind of hopeless. And so here are these stories about people who had really difficult experiences, really struggled, and interestingly, like took a long time to decide to divorce, but are now in a much more beautiful place who all reflect that they couldn't be where they are if they hadn't gone through it. So it's a service for people to, who are feeling stuck, as you said earlier, in the muck of it to know that there is light and so it's just stories upon stories upon stories and they're, they're absolutely fantastic and you mentioned light and i said in my opening your book light on the other side of divorce mm. is one i highly recommend and it's a must read what do you want someone to get out of the book light on the other side of divorce after reading it so here's what i really want I want y'all to heal through the trauma of the divorce so that you can go on and do the amazing work that you're meant to do in this world. Because we need to change this world. We need to make shifts and trauma and the trauma of divorce just holds us back. I want you to step into wherever you're supposed to be next. And I want you to do whatever you're meant to do, but I don't think you can do it if you're still holding on to that trauma. So that's what I hope the book does for all of you. And speaking of the book, you can purchase Dr. Cohen's book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce, on Amazon, Bookshop, Barnes & Noble. Dr. Cohen, this was absolutely fantastic. I'm thrilled that you joined us for a second time on the Shine Up podcast. Where can people find you to get in touch, and how can people reach out? You can find me on my website, which is drelizabethcohen.com. That's a D-R. And there you can reach out to me about the online program, consultations, and also my New York City practice. So you can find all of that there. And if you happen to be listening to this before the book launches, if you go to my website and buy the book through the book page, you get enrolled in three free workshops that I'm giving. And I know we've talked about it, those workshops and the tools and tips and techniques, those are invaluable. I encourage everybody, pick up a copy, pre-order it, go online and get a copy of Dr. Cohen's book, Light on the Other Side of Divorce, today. Thank you for coming on the Shine Up podcast. Congratulations on the upcoming book. I look forward to doing this again soon. Me too. Thank you so much, Evan. David, what a show on the Shine Up podcast, episode 10 in the books. Great stuff from the divorce doctor, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. Thank you for listening to the Shine Up podcast. Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, the divorce whisperer, the divorce doctor, psychologist, author, podcast host, just incredible insight. You can pre-order a copy of Dr. Cohen's book today, and you can follow her on social media and on her website, drelizabethcohen.com. To the listeners on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and wherever else you listen to your podcast, thank you for listening. Producer Dave, the best in the business, thank you as always. Follow the Shine Up podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Clubhouse. Follow, listen, subscribe, and shine on. I'm Evan Shine, and we'll talk to you again real soon.